Good afternoon. It is a good afternoon. You know why? Because, you know, some people, when they come to the end of their earthly life, there's some uncertainty that's there. Whereas others who know Jesus as the personal Savior, it's just a step in the glory. And things just keep getting better from that moment. And I know that uh, it's really hard on us to lose the people that we love so much. But it's not a time for us to mourn, but a time for us to celebrate. Because Phil is dancing with Jesus. You know that? I bet, I bet there's a swimming pool up there that Phil's in too. I don't know if you heard this, but he was like a, a swimming champion back in high school. Yeah, state, what is it, state champion in swimming. And so I think he's got his little Speedo on and he's up there. <laughs> if they allow those in heaven, I don't know. But anyways, thank you all for coming. I know it just, it just means so much to see the love on everybody's face in this house. And I know Charlene and their family so much appreciate your presence here. And we're just going to thank the Lord right now for his presence. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, thank you, thank you. That you don't cause us to despair, but you give us hope as believers. Lord, that you have prepared a place for us, and you promise us that in your word. And we all get to join you someday. And Lord, I know that this earth seems long to us, but time is really fleeting. But eternity is forever. And to know that we get to pass from our current suffering to that joy, to that life, to that vitality that there is in you, and being face to face to you gives us cause to celebrate today. God, we just invite you right now, we invite you right now to just let your spirit fall on this place. May your presence be palpable here today as we celebrate the life of a man who knows you and is with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Philip Thomas Rusnogger, at age 88, passed away peacefully at home on August 3rd, 2022, and he was surrounded by his wife and his children. Philip is survived by his wife of 61 years. Hard to believe. Hard to believe. You're not, how did you do that? Because you're only 45, right? 61 years, Charlene Carol Rusnoggle of Eugene, Oregon. His children, Robin Rusnoggle of Seattle, Washington, Penny Humphreys and husband Gordon Humphreys of Spokane, Washington, and Robin Rusnog, oops, I skipped there, and Scott Rusnoggle and wife Christina Rusnoggle of Eugene, Oregon. His grandchildren, Brady and Brevin Rusnoggle, Danny Miller, Kylan Hayden Humphreys, and two great grandchildren, Shepard and Lola, and Phil's sister, Janet Ellen Newman of Yuma, Arizona. He is preceded in death by his parents, Roland Henry and Sarah Ellen Rusnoggle, and brothers, Roy Alvin Rusnoggle, White Roland Rusnoggle, and Robert Lewis Rusnoggle. Phil was born on December 30th, 1933 in St. Louis, Missouri. He attended Central High School in St. Louis and graduated in 1952. And as I told you, while in high school, he was a two-year state champion in swimming and was a lifeguard for four years. Phil actively served in the United States from 1952 to 1954 and the reserves until 1960. When he came back from the Navy, his family bought their first car, a Pontiac, and moved to Corvallis, Oregon. Phil had a love for animals, and while in Corvallis, he bought a barrel horse named Patty. Phil enrolled in Oregon State College in 1955, and at the end of his freshman year, he left school and went to work for Boeing for one year, and then returned back and he finished school. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in animal husbandry in 1960. Phil met Charlene Carroll Stratton during college on a blind date at the Philomath Bowl 
and they married December 3, 1960. From 1960 to 1970, Phil and Charlene lived in a variety of places, Lacey, Washington, Portland, Oregon, and Chehalis, Washington, having their three children, Robin Carroll, Penny Kay, and Scott Thomas, along the way, and then he and his family moved to Eugene in 1970. Phil worked for Culligan Water and was a patrol officer for the Oregon State Police for nine months, and I understand he quit because during a Columbus Day storm, his car flipped over on its top. So I think he had enough of that. And then he went on to Pony Express for 20 years, 20 plus years. After Pony Express, he went to work for Miley Construction for eight years until his retirement in 2001. Phil was a jack of all trades. He loved woodworking, repairing equipment, and tinkering out in his shop. He also enjoyed camping in his RV, feeding birds and squirrels, and going to the coast. He and Charlene went on three cruises, Alaska, Panama Canal, and Western Caribbean. Phil attended Living Hope Church for 52 years. During his tenure, he helped build the church and served on the maintenance crew with Al Lee and John Arbogast for over 25 years. He was always a cheerful presence, greeting old and new friends from his station in the foyer of this church. Phil was cremated, and the family was spreading his ashes on the Oregon coast at a later date. And that was Phil saying, good job. <laughs> Just on a, on a personal note, I mean, I love Phil. I, you know, for, as a younger person, when, when I come to church, I didn't really know Phil well. Um, he was the guy that smoked the pipe, you know, I knew him as that, you know, and cheery, cheery kind of guy, but I didn't really know him. But when we moved back here to Eugene five years ago, and Phil and Charlene were so gracious in letting us park our fifth wheel at their house and become a part of their family, and I really got to know Phil, appreciate, and love him. You know, the, the tinkering thing, er, I, you know, I'm kind of a tinkerer and work on stuff, and every time... I had my head in the hole. Phil was there going, what you doing down there? And maybe if you do this and do that, and Phil had a lot of good suggestions. And at times, he'd get his head in the hole and start doing a little bit himself. And he just always was so interested in what Kathy and I were doing. He just, Phil was always, always interested. And just, you know, we come home. Uh, during, at the end of the day or leaving in the morning, they'd be sitting, Phil and Charlene be sitting right there in their kitchen by that window. That window would slide open. It's like, what you kids doing? Where are you going today? What's happening? How you doing? And we got to have those conversations every day and just, uh, you know, what, what a joy it was. And then I'd have to go, hey, we got to get going. So we'd sneak away and get good on to what we were doing, but to be able to come home and, and see their smiling faces again. And, and it, was just, it was just such a great thing to be around, like I say, that cheerful greeting presence, just like many of you, if you've come in this church, you'd see Phil out in the foyer. He's like always asking, how you doing? And that was Phil. Phil was not as much interested in himself and how he was doing as he was in how everyone else was doing. You know, he just, the only thing about his health issues that, that bothered him, it just made him angry because he didn't want to stop moving and going. And he'd get frustrated and angry about that. So I don't want to do this thing, you know. Oh, I've had enough of that. Or, oh, man, they got to make me do this. And it was just because Phil wanted to be out there just living life and not messing with that kind of stuff. But he always asked, how you doing? Even we, Kathy and I went and saw Phil there a couple of days before he passed. And Phil was having trouble breathing and, and just kind of communicating at first. And then he got some water in him and he, and he helped him lean his, scoot his chair up. He had an electric chair. And out of Phil's mouth he says, well, how you kids doing? <laughs> and we're like, Phil, we want to ask you that question. Well, I really want to know how you do it. It was just... That was Phil. That was Phil. And you know what? 
here's the wonderful thing when I think about that, is that I know Phil is making a full report to the Lord in heaven right now on every one of us. <laughs> Some of you are going, oh, no. But, but he's telling the Lord, man, I love this person because of that. You know what's going on in their life? Let me tell you about it, Lord. And God's going, I know, Phil, I know. But <laughs> Phil is there just continuing to cheer on everybody around him. And I know my friend that I love. I know my friend that I love is speaking to the Lord about me. And I can't wait to get to heaven to talk to the Lord about Phil and just how much I love him too. And Charlene and family, I'm going to miss those hugs. Got a hug every Sunday. Um, sometimes I thought between the two canes and the arms coming up, something was going to bad happen. But we still got the hug, and I appreciate it so much. Charlene indicated that they found a song that was in some of Phil's belongings when he passed. And he loved the hymns of the church, so I'm going to sing one for him. is calling, calling, will you answer me? See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Oh. 
He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your cup. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys. Uh, over the past three or four weeks, I had uh, several wonderful opportunities to, to visit with Phil, and they were um, special times. And uh, he, he told me at the talks and conversations uh, he was having with God and the things that he was learning and the things that uh, he was giving God permission to do. Um, and what I rem remember from that kind of boiled it all down was he said, you know, um, I, I know that I don't have much time left on this earth. Um, I also know, uh, I don't know the exact day, um, but I know that this moment that I take my last breath here, I'm going to be in the presence of God. And he said, I, I'm, I'm good with the fact that this life doesn't last forever. I'm good with the fact that I don't know exactly how much longer I have, and I'm really good with the idea that when I die and leave this body behind, I'm going to be with the Lord in heaven. And so that's why I got excited that this morning or this week I've been working on um, Philippians 3 and working through mostly the first part of it. And I got to looking at the last verse, which I think we're going to have on the screen here. Or maybe not. Um, which goes like, it, it's uh, Philippians 3.21. Christ will take our mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own. And it goes on to say, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. And I, I read that verse as part of just uh, what we're doing on Sunday mornings, and I thought, wow, that's a great verse for a memorial service. And then I thought, I don't know why this isn't on the, the list of top five verses for pastors to use when they do a memorial service, um, because it kind of wraps it all up, doesn't it? Yeah, these are mortal bodies. They weren't designed to last forever. Uh, but when this mortal body lasts or gives out, if we're part of Jesus and his circle of love, uh, then we receive uh, a glorious body like his own, and we will be part of that experience of rejoicing when he moves into full control once again. So I think, being a preacher, I've got to take just a few moments in each one of those um, 
He will take our mortal bodies. Phil had a mortal body. Uh, you've got a for- mortal body. My, I've got a mortal body. And, um, you know, Derek did a good job of saying it was such a frustration to him every time he found out more of the mortality of that body. And one more part gave out or one more trip we had to go to the doctor and then at the end he was on the oxygen tank. And every one of those steps was frustrating for him. And I think that's the same for you too. Every time we find out, oh yeah, all these body parts aren't designed to last forever. They have a, they have a short lifespan actually. It becomes a frustration for us. Um, our physical bodies... You know, the honest truth is our physical bodies were, last, were meant to last just long enough that we could receive Jesus and become part of his eternal family. And we could tell a few others how they could do the same. And after that, we move into the real part of life, which is our eternal life. And so we have mortal bodies. Jesus is going to change our mortal body at some point into glorious bodies like his own. And I don't know exactly what that means, but isn't that exciting that we're going to have a glorious body like Jesus' body? And what little bit we have in the evidence when Jesus came back from being in the tomb for three days and he was given his glorified body, he could just poof, appear in a room, move through doors, no impedance to him. His disciples were meeting in a locked room. They were scared for their lives. And all of a sudden, Jesus just appears. You're going to have a body like that one day. He could transport himself from point A to point B that's 20 miles away in just a second. You know, you won't even need Star Trek. <laughs> you're, you're going to be a body that for whom space is no longer any barrier or any consideration. And probably a whole lot of other things, too, that aren't recorded. Uh, we're going to leave these earthly bodies behind and we're going to receive the body that Christ has given to us, the, the glorious body. For, um, and then the, the last thought. Um, he's going to transform them into bodies like his, um, using the same power. So the power that gives us those mortal bodies would be the same power with which um, he will bring everything under control. Um, we know that God has the power to give uh, resurrection life. God has the power to take a dead body and make it live again. Uh, Jesus was dead. He was buried. He was sealed in the tomb for three days. And then afterwards, he appears. And um, every one of the Gospels ends up with that point. That was, that's the climax. Four different stories about the life of Christ. And everyone ends at exactly the same point. To begin at different points... They have different ups and downs. They tell different stories, different parables, different problems that Jesus encounters. Uh, But they all end at the same point. Dead for three days, raised again. And then every one of Paul's letters, where he writes to churches and say, here's what it really means to be a Christian. And every one, he says, the most important thing for you to know is that Christ was dead and he's now alive. And he comes to you, giving you the same opportunity that in your physical deadness, but also your spiritual deadness, Christ can come and give you life. Um, One of his letters, Paul, as he's writing to his friends at the town of Corinth, he says, you should know that we're so confident that Jesus was raised from the dead. He says, I wasn't there. I didn't see it myself, I must admit. But I know there's, I've talked to 500 people that saw him at the same time, at the same event. 500 people. One or two people that see him, you kind of think, "Eh, you know, I'm not for sure. 500 people, there's a lot of confidence. God has the power to give life to the dead. And we also know that God will bring everything under his control. This is what we find in our last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. There's a lot of strange things in that book, and I I think I have some of it figured out, and most of it's way over my head. But what I do know is at the end, we win. At the end, the people of God win. At the end, the forces of good finally triumph over evil, and God is established on the throne, and Jesus is on the throne, and there are millions and millions, called, it says myriads and myriads, giving him praise. Uh, Philippians, uh, we're preaching through the book of Philippians on two Sunday mornings here. Uh, Philippians 2 says it this way, One day every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess 
that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that honesty and hope that Phil had can also be our honest appraisal and our hope-filled expectancy as well. Nobody, nobody lasts forever. None of us can know when our time can come. But we can have the assurance that when our time does come, that we are ushered into the presence of God the same way that Phil was. Um, we had the opportunity. It is a glorious opportunity that we have. Would you pray with me just a short time as we say, Lord Jesus, what a glorious thing that you've designed for us that we would experience a slow decay. That's not glorious. We'd experience a slow decay of these bodies. One day they would finally give out for all sorts of different reasons. But no matter the reason that our body gives out, what happens then if, if we've trusted in you and we've experienced the joy of spiritual life and eternal life, that we will be ushered into your presence, that it will be glory and joy, and that you will transform our bodies in the glorious bodies like your own, and we will be with that crowd that's rejoicing when we assert, see you assert your authority over all things for all time. I thank you for the hope that gives within us and for uh, both the hope and the yearning that we feel in the as absence, the uh, physical presence, that we can be united with him around your throne. And so we pray in your name. Amen. So now we have um, our time for you to share your own stories and memories. Uh, we have a couple of roving microphones, and I think there's um, grandsons that are going to man those. If you have a story to tell or just a, a little bit of a testimony, or, uh, uh, raise your hands so we know where to go, and we'll bring the microphones. It's important that we have the microphones for... Um, attempting to record this, and if we don't get you on the microphone, you won't be on the recording. Uh, so who will be first and share a story of what Phil meant to you? Who's the person of courage? Way back there in the back row. Okay, Bonnie. Okay, I'll be the first one here. Um, Phil and Charlene have been longtime friends. And Phil and I had um, a very um, unique interest. And every once in a while, um, maybe this is a secret I shouldn't be telling in public, but Phil and I would go on a date. Now, we would invite Charlene, because that's just good manners, right? Um, and so we would go on a date. And we would um, visit a restaurant. And we would um, compare our notes on liver and onions. We just loved liver and onions. Charlene was such a good sport, and she didn't make too many faces when we would indulge in our favorite meal together. And I'm going to miss my, my date buddy. And uh, maybe Charlene and I can still on, go on dates, but I don't think she's going to join me with the liver and onions. Derek uh, mentioned that Phil had a passion, and I mean just a compassion and a, uh, a commitment. Even the Bible, it says if you don't have a good foundation, of, in this case a church, but in your home, it's going to fall apart. And Phil and a couple of other his uh, friends, they kept this church going. I'm not exaggerating. I mean physically, literally uh, repaired things and kept this church uh, in a position that we can enjoy it like we to do today and I appreciate him Charlene much the same way but Phil was just everywhere just like Derek said trying to help in any way he could uh, he had some help but it was his passion that led everything that torch has now been passed to an individual who I appreciate and respect Dave Powell and he's with his church and uh, He's doing the same thing Phil did. So get a chance to uh, meet Dave, give him a pat on the back, and uh, we'll all thank him for the next 20 years or so. Oh, 
Well, Fred, Fred and I and Sandy and Charlene were the best of friends. And when these church doors were open, you could count on mm -hmm. Bill being here, whether he was at a work party, whether he was at a church service, he was always an inspiration to us and we'll truly miss him immensely. He was a good, good, good friend and I loved the man uh, throughout the time we spent together, which was many years. So Bill, just save us all a place up there. Thank you. Well, Mike is right here, so I think I'll step up next. Um, I had the privilege of celebrating our birthdays together for 52 years. And uh, <clears throat> so it's a long, deep friendship. Uh, we used to sing a song together, and we would sing happy birthday to us. And, you know, and he would not let me get out of that. We had to sing happy birthday to us. And uh, so I have my heart is full of joy of having experienced Bill in my life. Um, he's like a big brother to me. And a very, very precious person. Love him. Phil, we've been a real good friend. I uh, got good uh, heart, very good heart. And you're always a joyous person, and uh, I'm gonna miss you. I love you. Bye.
Any of you know what, uh, what uh, Phil's blood looked like? I think it was orange and black, as I recall. <laughs> anyway, I, I look forward every Sunday morning to Phil coming in, and we talk about the football games from Saturday. And he always had an issue because the register guard never had Oregon State football on the front page of the sports section. And I told him one day, I said, Phil, you know, the Corvallis paper doesn't have the Ducks on their front page of the sports section either. So we finally came to an agreement that that was all right. And uh, Phil, you're going to be missed. One nice fella. I just wanted to say I'm thankful for Phil, for Phil and Charlene. I was uh, I used to be into drugs and stuff, but I went to church here. But um, <clears throat> but um, so anyway, I had gotten in trouble when I was in jail, and uh, I needed somewhere to get out um, so I could stay. I needed like a legit place to stay. You know, they needed to check it out and it needed to be good. And so, but they volunteered to do that. So um, I was just so thankful for that. But looking back on it. It was just, uh, you know, I know it was the leading of the Lord for them, and they followed it, and they helped me, and I could see back all the, all the ways the Lord helped me, and it was through them, you know, that got me clean and sober today and walking with the Lord. So I'm just thankful for that. I have known Phil for 50 some years and uh, we've been meeting 
probably almost every Tuesday for almost all of those years. And we'd sit there and talk about everything and anything. And But uh, Phil was like a brother. One of those guys that uh, you can know and love easily because he was a very simple man in that uh, he knew how to treat people very well. Uh, he loved his family. We talk about that quite often and shared things which is kind of uncommon but uh, the many things that we did share were meaningful to me um, I enjoyed our time together and and I love that man and I'm sorry to see him go but I know he's well I know where he's at and I expect to see him a few years down the road. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. Leanna, I was waiting for you to stand up. <laughs> I feel like somebody needs to speak on behalf of us girls, Robin included, who grew up together. And Phil was like one of those people who was our dad, right? We had lots of dads. I called this guy my dad, Leonard LeBlanc, Fred, and Phil was another one of those guys who just, and you know what I remember the most about him? He always laughed at us. We probably weren't that funny, we thought we were. We probably weren't that entertaining, but Phil made us feel good because he just made us feel like we were you know, we were good people, and we were normal people, and w just because we were teenagers and dumb and all that stuff, it didn't matter to Phil. And my favorite memory of Phil was um, just recently when we lived over there, Derek and I went out somewhere at night, and we were kind of late coming home. And I noticed the lights on the porch were still on, and I thought, oh, they forgot to turn off the lights. No. Phil was waiting up for us. And he said, I just wanted to make you kids know, or I just want to make sure you kids got home safe. And so I think I said, thanks, Dad. We appreciate that. And that's how we felt about Phil, was he was just always there kind of looking over us. So thanks, Phil. And thanks, Charlene, for sharing him with us. I'm the other part of that. My name is Leanne. Um, I just have one story to tell. It's from the fourth grade. We were um, all we all went to church camp together, and there was if you had a station wagon here in the church, you automatically were taking the kids to camp. I don't think you were even asked. You were just told that's what you were doing, and so we would all get in the station wagon, and we would all get everybody wanted the very back, so that's where we would sit. And my first year going. I, I normally get car sick. So of course, in Phil and Charlene's car, I got sick all over everybody. <laughs> and Phil gave me my very first church nickname, and that was Barfy. And he, <laughs> he calls me Barfy. Just a few months ago when I saw him last time, he said, hey Barfy, how you doing? <laughs> so anyways, and I, I appreciated it, Charlene because after that, I always got to ride in the front seat, and I think she always took the back seat. <laughs> I know Phil and Charlene's brother, Seth Paul, and uh, I'm not going to remember his name.
was so patient with us. And uh, I also remember about five years ago when he was in his Sunday high school reunion, came here for a Sunday service, and he was out there in the corner, always screaming at everybody. And he looks at me, and he goes, young man, are you lost? <laughs> I said, I once was lost, but I've been found for a long time. He gives me a wink and goes, good. Singer. <laughs> That's what I'm going to remember. Um, I kind of try to sneak out most of the time. Um, Bill Singer. Uh, I, I forget. <laughs> I just have to, I don't think I have the music for you. I have a stroke center in my head. Just so. Phil was, to me, one of the last good old boys. Phil was always there. We loved to camp. Phil was always there. We went to Diamond Lake to fish. A, a, a lot of these people in here went with that group, and some of them are already in heaven that uh, uh, would go with us, like uh, Ostranders. Uh, oh, oh, I can't name them all. I'm getting to that point myself <laughs> I can't remember names anymore. I can remember faces, but not names. But anyway, Phil was always there. You turn around, he didn't carry a gun. We went hunting, we went over to the meadow, and uh, Miley's were there, and the older Miley's were there. Uh, the whole group of us from church, we'd make a big circle in the meadow, and Phil was there. We'd go to Diamond Lake fishing, and. Phil and Charlene were there. Charlene would be playing with the kids. Phil would be wandering around, checking things out. He never fished, but he enjoyed camping. And uh, anything, and anything that needed done, anybody that needed help, Phil was ready to lend a hand. And I remember him for that. He was a good old boy. Love Phil. My wife and I have known Phil and Charlene for approximately 45 years, maybe 50, <laughs> she said. And uh, I, all I can say is, amen. <laughs> so he was my uncle, Phil. And he was my, my parents both died when I was very young. And um, Phil and Charlene have been sort of my de facto parents and my kids de facto grandparents they've shown up for their graduations their whatever and it's he it was always there for us I could walk into their house and be one of their kids and never have to worry and um, we're gonna miss him um, but he's definitely was getting frustrated with his physical condition and he's definitely in a better place I'm sure he and my grandmother are having a few arguments over politics or whatever else they're arguing over. Um, but you know what, they're both like um, having a good time up there. So we will miss him, um, but truly has been my whole life a huge influence. And so we will miss him.
Anybody else? Thank you for your sharing. It's, uh, it's been great. I think we have another song now. Is that right, Cindy? Yeah. here today um, on behalf of me and my family. It is wonderful to see family we haven't seen in years. Um, but we, uh, this is one of my dad's favorite songs, favorite hymns, and hymns were his, his most favorite to sing. So I would like everybody to join with us as we sing How Great Thou Art. And we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Would you stand with us? pray together as we close our service, and you're certainly welcome to stay just as long and catch up with each other, but uh, oh, Lord Jesus, um, days like today are such filled with a strange combination of uh, laughter and tears. Uh, we're grateful for uh, people like Phil, whose love and whose presence made us fully aware uh, both of the laughter in our life and of the, the tears and of the sorrows in our life. His passing leaves such a big hole 
And what we're asking now for ourselves and especially for the family is that you would pour yourself into that hole, that you would fill us, that your presence, that your peace, uh, that your hope uh, would uh, just be all that we need to have at this point in our life. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and give you grace. May the Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. And all you're coming in and then you're going out and you're lying down and then you're rising up in your labor as well as your leisure. Until that then when we shall all be presented before the Lord Jesus in whom there is no sunset, tears, or sorrow. Amen.